Welcome to this week's FHSS podcast. Today, we are delighted to welcome Associate Professor in International Communications, Dr. Corey Schultz. Corey previously taught at the University of Southampton, at Goldsmiths in the University of London, and the University of California in Berkeley. He joined UNNC in 2019. Corey has a PhD from Goldsmiths in Media and Communications and an MA in Asian Studies uh, with a China concentration from UC Berkeley. He studied at Tsinghua University in Beijing, as well as Fudan University in Shanghai, and was a recipient of the Canada-China Scholars Exchange Program, CCSEP, funded by the China Scholarship Council. Corey recently published the chapter The World and Beijing World Park, Film Tourism, Intermedia, Embodiment and the Fake. And he is here to talk to us about this publication today. Welcome, Corey. Hello, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Could you first perhaps give us a brief overview of the paper, maybe focusing on the actual topic and the main argument? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, So basically, this chapter came out of a conference that I had organized here at UNNC. Just to back up a little bit, I've organized a couple different conferences here, all on the theme of Chinese film. And um, so basically, what the chapter is, is it examines Jia Zhangke's film, The World, and the setting for the film, which is the Beijing World Park in Beijing. So several years ago, I had a travel grant from the British Academy, and I was able to visit these specific sites in China in order to do my research. It had to do with um, museums and and uh, heritage sites. Um, And during this time, I was able to kind of swing by Beijing World Park because I was in the area and it was also very important to me, mainly because I was such a fan of Jia Zhangke's films. So to back up a little bit, The World is a film set in the Beijing Film Park. And it's basically about the people that work in the park and that kind of struggle in the park. And so these people are kind of um, mingong, so they're kind of workers that travel from place to place. Some are different levels. Some are work as just as security guards for very low income. Others are entertainers that are there to kind of entertain visitors to the park. And so there's this juxtaposition of, I guess, the fantasy and the uh, drama and the excitement of the park with their kind of mundane lives or their quite um, humble lives. So um, because I was a fan, I really wanted to go to this place and kind of explore it. And I didn't actually start as a research project per se. It just mostly started as a desire to go to this space. And so when I was there, I was kind of acting as what's called a a film-induced tourist, which is what Sue Beaton's term. And there's also many other like theories that kind of connect with it as well. Um, such as this desire for like a cult geography, which is Matt Hill's um, idea about to occupy spaces that uh, someone is a fan of. So in this case, a, a film fan, right? So I was kind of drawn to this space and I really wanted to check out the um, the realness of the, sa- of the space, the falseness of the space and the performativity of the space. And so this chapter is all about examining this film tourism, also the falseness of the space as and the, and the realness of the space in the film, plus my own experience in the space, observing other tourists, and also my desire, basically, to put myself in the spot of the camera by positioning my body in a way that I would actually be in the same space as the camera was when the film was shot. So basically, this entire chapter is examining this, this phenomenon. That's great. I would ask, I guess, you've given us a lot of different areas where the paper is significant. So there's the personal, right? So there's positioning yourself vis-a-vis the the phenomena. I guess there's the kind of macro social where you're looking at how the individuals who are involved in the park do this. And and you touch on the theoretical as well in terms of the uh, construction of these spaces being kind of interesting as a cultural phenomenon, I suppose. In your mind, what do you think is the most significant of these, the main contribution yeah. that you want people to take? Um, when we think about film tourism, we often have thought about historical film tourism or economic film tourism. But um, there's been this kind of turn to more like affective, like affect uh, things that are on non-discursive, extra textual and non-discursive. Hmm. Um, and basically the effect of the emotional impact on film tur- tourism as well. Also, um, there's been a turn towards thinking about how spaces are performed. So pe- basically how people act or perform in these spaces. 
And originally, when I was um, researching this area, um, I realized there was kind of like a, a dearth of considering the affect of the space or the desire of the space. And then, um, so this kind of led me down several different channels in order to kind of um, explain this further. And I'm happy to note that another book has recently come out that kind of thinks about these elements as well. So I think there's definitely a, a different turn to film tourism to kind of think about these elements. Mm. Yeah. I think building on that particularly interests me there, this idea that the human body is so involved within this. You talk about this at one point as adding the medium of um, embodiment to this idea of the nexus of the kind of relationship between film architecture and um, performance um, and how it's so important to people to share the same space as the film. Why do you think that is so important to us nowadays? Um, and also, I think this is quite a personal question because obviously there's a strong ethnographic element here mm. and it seemed to be quite important to you to actually embody that as well. Why is that element so important to us in our society now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think if I were to make a general comment, I think that there perhaps there might be this desire, I guess in a land of the virtual, and our, our worlds are so virtual now, right? So maybe there is this desire to actually have a quote unquote connection to the real, right? I think that in my paper, I kind of go a bit further about considering like notions of the virtual and then sometimes the desire to actually make the virtual real. And in this case, to actually visit the spaces itself. I, I did pick up on that yeah. in the paper. And that to me was almost the most interesting bit, kind of where the sort of the fake became the real in yeah. this way, this relationship between what is real, what is fake, what is on the screen, then how do you reenact that yourself and why that's the sort of relationship that I felt seems to say something about our society today and what we need out of mm. it. Could you elaborate on that at all? Because for me, that's the yeah. most fascinating bit. I think um, this is something I've been kind of, it's a theme, a recurring theme in my research that I've been trying to like follow up or kind of grapple with. And I kind of always kind of revisit it. So for example, um, because I'm, this I'm a fan of Jajanka's films, uh, he did a documentary called 24 City. And part of those elements are actually a performed documentary. So they actually have professional actors that are reading lines from real people, right? So I kind of became really quite amazed with that. And because some people, I was amazed with the reactions about it because some people were like, oh, they're actors. We know who these people are. Um, this isn't real. And then other people were really touched by it. And so there's this kind of um, chasm between these two reactions. And so I kind of was kind of approaching that study by thinking about how even if they're scripted or enacted, they actually produce real emotions, regardless of the source is real or fake. And of course, this kind of um, dives into like theory on literature, why we're moved by stories that we obviously know are fiction, right? Why we have these reactions, we cry, we scream, uh, we laugh, right? So regardless of the source, it has a real effect. And mm -hmm. this is something that I was kind of really kind of um, interested in. And I explored later in another paper here at UNNC, there was a conference on media and fakery. When they suggested that I submit a proposal for a, a, a topic, I was thinking, oh, this is a, something that I really want to develop in other ways as well. And so I, I remembered going to an exhibit, um, Damien Hirst's exhibit, uh, Treasures of the Wreck of the Unbelievable, that was at the Venice Biennale. And in this exhibit, basically what he did is he recreated these finds, these quote unquote finds, archaeological objects that were allegedly found in um, a sunken ship that, and, and he was like, oh, look at these amazing finds. And there was this ancient collector and he collected all these artifacts from around the world. And now we found them. And it was this mass theater, like everybody knew it was fake, like, but it was this mass theater around it. And these, these sculptures were incredibly designed and they would have like these amazing little barnacles and little uh, sponges added to them as if they were recently recovered. But then there was this kind of um, campiness or quirkiness to it. Like some of them were actually like statues of Mickey Mouse, you know? So it was like this kind of insane thing. And it was this kind of insane thing. I was just, everybody was just joyous there because it was just so over the top and it was playing with all these different tropes of like museum exhibitions and whatnot. And then for this paper, I started researching what people had responded and we had the same kind of chasm. People were really like angry about it because it's like obviously fake. And the other team are like, this is just whimsical and amazing. And, you know, and so I think this is a recurring theme in my research that I kind of keep coming back to. Um, and I think it mainly lies in the 
in the because I'm interested in this kind of not only this theme, but also documentaries, pseudo documentaries, performative documentaries, fiction films and cultural products and how they kind of all interact and whatnot. Do you think there's an element of the camp there where you have obvious fakes of these, you know, very, very famous landmarks right. and then you have the the public engagement with them but obviously not with the actual items themselves. And and you write about this in the chapter as well, the way that people seem to take joy in the fact that these obviously are reproductions. Yeah, I think camp is more like a tongue-in-cheek kind of you're-in-the-know type of thing. I think for for this film, it was, I guess, joy in the recreation and the, fa- and the falseness and the pleasure of it, I think, which is... Uh, which kind of comes out in the film when people, when tourists are interacting with the space and also which kind of came out when I was in the space itself. Because not only am I going as this film-induced tourist, right? I want to be in this space and, and inhabit the same space. I want to put my body my body in the same space of the camera, which also kind of reflects back to like the past century of, of film theory scholarship, whereby people were theorizing about, um, you know, this camera as being this uh, mobile eye or this wandering kind of, embodied thing right so it kind of reflects back to that but it's also about just enjoying maybe the spectacle of the space and just the the raw enjoyment of it right that's interesting because that sort of joy that you're talking about seems to contradict some of the elements of the film itself and that the film is quite sad in its themes in its sort of construction of people who are migrant workers who are in a bad situation who may be exploited in some way so there seems to be a real contradiction between the way that people are enjoying the park and and you or film tourists are sort of enjoying recreating those and the actual kind of commentary of the film itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really um the message or the one of the things that's very apparent in the film, this kind of division. Um I think when I was reading Jaws notes for it, he said he wanted to kind of capture this kind of entertainment thing but this kind of this sadness, I guess, of the falsity of it. And I think that's one thing that the the film operates on these two levels. And so often when you see these people in the park, you kind of know about their quotidian lives and you know about their struggles, but you also see this kind of they're performing this role of being entertaining for these film tourists, right? And so in the film, there's these often very kind of um, melancholy scenes, and then they're juxtaposed with a performance that they do on stage. And this performance is filled with color and dance and movement and beautiful people. And and it's just this kind of juxtaposition. And these two, I don't know, these two kind of, I guess, feelings or affective states that run in the film that I, I think makes it so, so striking for me and makes it something that I really wanted to sure. engage with. Yeah. Is that something that we see in documentaries in sort of quite often in that we'll often have people, say, migrant workers or people in bad situations being sort of represented in a way that is designed to elicit kind of pity from us? But actually, when often you see people in in real life, they're kind of getting along with their lives, doing okay, making the best they can in essence. So is that melancholy part of the fakery? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. Like often, like I think it depends on the documentary itself. I think sometimes they're kind of positioned, they position, say, these people as as um, victims, right? Yes. And then other times, other documentaries are more like they kind of want to examine the agency of these people, right? Um, and I think in my book, I actually have a chapter on migrant workers and um, I talk about both feelings, so this per, this um, migrancy as a way of promotion or independence or see the world, right? But then juxtaposed with this kind of precarious state of the migrants, right? So I think how both can kind of exist in the same space, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It, it reminds me a little bit of of kind of performance and um, linguistic studies of of performativity and things like that. So you have Goffman's idea of front stage and backstage and. And so there's something going on that you're supposed to perform and then then take on as a performance and then the, the so-called reality of it taking place behind the curtain. And, and you describe this a little bit in the park as, you know, on the surface, there's the monuments and then you start to look at them more closely and they're peeling and they're not really authentic that way. And you, you use the term at, at one point, the idea of simulated pleasure as, as being part of taking from these performances. And I'm, I'm just curious about this idea of 
maybe what is a simulated pleasure and what is a pleasurable simulation? So a simulated pleasure and a yeah. pleasurable simulation. I guess a simulated pleasure, yeah, I guess it's more like a performance of pleasure that is not does not have like an authentic root, perhaps one could say. And then what was your other term? Well, I, I just flipped it on yeah. its head because when, when you use the term simulated pleasure, uh, that the copy world mm. creates this kind of simulated pleasure. But I, I use pleasurable s simulation because you, you can get this authentic yeah. pleasure out of of the simulation itself. Uh, of the simulation. Yeah. I guess it kind of comes back to the, the, the joy in the fake, mm. right? And about basically how there's these two different um, reactions to it, right? So people can either come and say, oh, you know, this um, the Taj Mahal is not authentic, obviously, because it's peeling and it's only, um, what, one third the size of the real thing. And it's actually not made of the same material and, and that type of stuff. But there is actually this kind of joy in the simulation of it, right? The copy of it, right? So it's like, you know, this Debordian kind of hyper reality and this kind of how it kind of creates this different state than the reality, right? So they often become, they're obviously connected things, but they're actually two different things in a way. That for me is quite an interesting point here. And in I feel this sort of notion of where does the enjoyment sort of come from here? Um, I guess from a starting point, you'd say nobody is pretending that these things are real. So there's no attempt to kind of sort of actually present them as real in this way. So there's huge enjoyment in the fakery that we have here, I suppose. Is that in some way a sort of getting rid of the kind of fetishization of authenticity? Because sort of everything in society now seems to be about getting back to the authentic, getting back to the real, sort mm -hmm. of seeking out what is real, what is authentic. This idea that you want to be able to say, I'm a real person, I have the real deal here, I have the authentic thing here and sort of get past kind of the fakery. What I sort of like about this is that it seems to be sort of throwing that out and it seems to be kind of getting rid of that and actually saying, you can enjoy the gaudy, you can enjoy the fake, you can in have a good experience around this, in essence. And that for me is, is very celebratory. But again, it goes back to this contradiction with the actual themes of the film, in that you have this sort of misery of, of migrant workers in such a way also represented. Another element that the paper touched on that I think links back to what you were just uh, referring to here is this idea of when we are sort of presenting this display, it's very much a display of foreignness. Um, and this was one of the bits that most interested me in the paper. This idea that we are, that we have um, Chinese performers within China kind of playing at what you call cosmopolitan um, ethnicities that have been sinicized for domestic consumption. That very much sort of this display of foreignness for the audience and their entertainment and pleasure almost reminded me of a sort of reverse construction of Orientalism, in a way it felt. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because for me, that's by far almost the most interesting bit. Yeah, no, that's, um, I think some people have kind of tried to peel that back a bit further, right? So there is this kind of, um, during a specific period of time, there was this kind of turn towards, I guess, an, an Occidentalism, right? Yes. In a way, you know, taking these... Um, iconic structures or, or whatnot, um, people and kind of um, arranging them in a specific way, right? Kind of this kind of a entertainment spectacle of it. And I think um, for a long time uh, in China, there was very popular to have these entire neighborhoods that were created on the same kind of idea about, um, well, we want to reconstruct a French neighborhood here. Or we have like Thames Town in Shanghai, which is like, we're going to make Little England in, in Shanghai, right? And we're going to have like English art architecture and, and English landscaping, and it's going to be like living in England, right? And so there was this kind of interesting, fascinating desire of these middle and upper class um, Chinese people to kind of do these recreations, live in these recreations, enjoy these recreations, right? And there was a specific turn that was happening. I think it kind of started probably in the 90s into the 2000s. I'm not too sure if it's still as strong as it was, because it seems to be there's kind of a more of a turn to more of like a traditional or quote unquote authentic kind of um, Chineseness, right? But um, I think there was definitely something there, this kind of a desire to kind of package international, but actually make, you know, have it in a domestic product, right? And I think this is a, a longer tradition in China as well. We can see that in sometimes about how um, uh, minority peoples are represented, especially the early representation of minority peoples on film, et cetera, et cetera. There is this kind of exoticization of the other. That other could be a minority person in China or it could be uh, a foreigner, right? 
so I think that's that kind of pulls in from that as well. Yeah, I've I've lost count of how many kind of Venice of the East we seem to have around here. Sort of yeah. everywhere I go in Asia, there seems to be another Venice of of the East. Yeah, I was actually in a very small, like not a small, uh, kind of a provincial, a, a minor provincial town. And I was on the bus trying to get to this very um, historic pagoda, right? That was very, very famous. I was on this bus and I looked out the window and there was a relatively recent neighborhood that was completely constructed as if it was from like a, an arrondissement in Paris. It had like French mansard roofs. It had the same kind of material and it was just so shocking because all of a sudden I felt like, you know, did I, did I miss my stop? Am I like, <laughs> am I in Paris now? It was, it was actually quite incredible. So, um, yeah, I think. What desire is that catering for? Oh, I guess maybe it's kind of a, I guess on one hand it is, it is beautiful, right? It's something that I did not grow up in Paris, but, um, I kind of know of these images of Paris and it would be a, a draw for me. Like if I just think of my own engagement with it. When I saw it, I was my first reaction was, "Oh, how beautiful! Wow, how fantastic!" And then my my cognitive brain kicked in and said, "Oh, but you know, this is actually a, just a recreation of something that you'd see in France." And da 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 da. So I imagine that there's a lot of joy in in mm. in this, especially for people. I, I mean, it was also a, a luxury. Um, it looked like a luxury um, accommodate, not accommodations, but luxury housing. So probably it's for people that actually have experienced lots of um, international travel and just want to kind of recreate it at home. That's interesting because in part of your paper, you also kind of talk about how the park itself and the recreations of sort of globality in the park are catering for um, a domestic tourists who do not have the means to leave China, in essence. And, and that interested me because I do see a lot of international budget travel from China going to mm. other parts of the world, mostly kind of tour operators in that way. So I couldn't quite work out who the park was for um, and who things like the recreation you're talking about are actually for. Are they for people within China? Are they for people who don't leave? Is this for people who leave and then come back and want this? Yeah, I think it's it probably now caters to a variety of people. I think the film is from 2004. So already we have like 20 years. And of course, travel has changed a lot. I think I know most recently I've heard that um, the largest foreign group to go to Thailand, I believe, is Chinese tourists. Yes, yeah, more, yes yeah. I've heard that too. Not during COVID, obviously, but um, previous to COVID. So I think um, uh, I haven't really studied uh, domestic travel, but I do know that um, there's been a huge uptake in middle class and upper class Chinese people going overseas. It's kind of common, right? I think um, many of our students have gone overseas Many of their parents have gone overseas, so it is quite common now. Uh, 20 years ago, I imagine when the park and um, when the other people that are writing about similar parks were constructed, I don't think it was quite as common. But what I think is interesting is a lot of these parks, they actually use, there's, and there's many parks, not just the one in Beijing, there's also several. Um, are they churches. still successful? Are they still going today? Yeah, that's fun. I, I should look into that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, when I was checking their websites, they still move on. Um, they're still going on. I'm kind of interested about this Beijing World Park because um, when I originally went there, it was actually the kind of the end of the metro line and the area was not that developed. But I actually recently went there this summer after I had completed the chapter and submitted it, etc. And the city has expanded quite a bit out. And what I was noticing is that it had actually decayed even further from my original trip. And I would not be surprised if in the future it just disappeared and became another real estate development, right? I guess it's like anything entertainment. It has like a temporal quality to it, right? It kind of rises up. It's really popular and then it like kind of falls away. But um, you do, you definitely do get the feeling in this park that it's generally directed towards people who have never left the, the country, right? It's also, um, you don't really see a lot of people that are visibly foreign, I mean, when I was there the first time, people would actually stop me and take photos with me. You know, I'm not too sure if I, I don't think they felt I was part of the set, but I was definitely something that was like, oh, OK, this is kind of all matches. Right. You know, we'll get a photo with a visibly foreign person. Right. So I, I think that was there. And then so this this more recent trip, it was it's generally it's much more decayed. I'm not too sure for the last. They were kind of surprised when I bought my ticket, when the the, the ticket agent and whatnot. Um, but then, I, but I did see some other people that were, um, they, we were speaking, you know, they're obviously not from there. So, yeah. Can I uh, just pick up on the, the idea of temporality? Because one, one thing that I was interested with 
uh, in the chapter and then with the conversation that we've had now is the idea of connecting a kind of historical past with these monuments, this present, the, the old with the new, the idea of the people being embedded within this. So I, I'm going to create a, a kind of confluence of questions here and, and let you uh, comment on that. So I, I was thinking in terms of the phenomenon, for example, in Canada, like pioneer villages and, and connecting us to our past there using this kind of theme park or, or historical immersion situation. And then you have the, the contemporary phenomenon here of uh, the old streets, the Laogia, or the, the tourist areas that are reproducing an historical past, but a largely imagined historical past in, in many ways, or a reconstructed and also potentially fake past. And then in, in your chapter, you were talking about the historical inaccuracies or the, the ways that certain things couldn't actually be juxtaposed with one another because there there seemed to be an atemporality involved in the park where you have uh so, so I'm, I'm curious in a way were were the pyramids new ish or you know what how does time work uh, along with identity and historicity i guess how does time work yeah um it was mostly not to capture a period of history, like the first two examples, like Old Street or Pioneer Village, that kind of captures a specific period of history, specific time and place. And I think these this park functioned mostly just to kind of uh, capture iconographic landmarks that were familiar to people, even though they had actually never been in the places, right? And so I think there was this kind of intertextuality at operation, right? But it wasn't like um, uh, in the sense of the images were easy to recognize and kind of consume, or you could see them and like, hey, that looks familiar. Oh, it's this, right? So there was kind of that, and mainly because these images have traveled around the world, right? So we all kind of know what, um, you know, the pyramids of Giza are, even if we've never been to Egypt, right? But um, I think there wasn't an attempt for this, like you were saying, this temporality, right? It wasn't kind of trying to recreate a, a specific time and place, like you you talk about how they do in China here or how they do in other countries, right? Yeah, like the heritage villages and, and whatnot. Thanks for that, Corey. Um, moving sort of uh, connected to that that Derek was just asking about, one point that sprung out to me um, in your paper was actually this kind of idea that now we go to these places um, not to sort of passively consume them or to actually see them, but to derive pleasure from comparing the image we already have with the actual reality in this sense. It almost felt like there was a different motivation, shall we say, for, for going there. And one that, is this very much sort of part of the digital age now, in essence? Is this very much kind of, we've seen these things so much everywhere. Now, ultimately, what we want to do is to see if, real, to test reality and to see if, if it kind of matches with what we've already seen and what we have in our heads which seems very different to 20 years ago when I was a sort of a tourist and you were actually mm -hmm. going to see these places themselves. Mm -hmm. Now are you going to, to test reality to mm -hmm. see if it lives up to the image that you have? Yeah. No, I think that's a, a great further study if people were, um, I've heard about um, like Instagram tourism, right? Where people are kind of become, that's how they do their research about visiting a tourist space, right? They go on Instagram and see what, other, what have other people been um, posting on Instagram about it. And so it kind of becomes this um, not only a hobby for some people because they just want to see these beautiful pictures and kind of pretend they're on vacation, but it becomes a way for people to kind of inform themselves about planning a vacation, right? And so this Instagram is kind of this travel inducement, like a travel induced tourist, right? This kind of becomes like that. I think it's a, a great area that people could expand further. Um, and also it comes to the stage I kind of am at the point because I have looked at all these images and I'm kind of engaged with all these things. And I'm sometimes I'm at the point is, oh, have I actually been to this place? Or <laughs> have I just seen so many pictures about it? Right. And sometimes I have to like stop and kind of go, wait, did I actually have I actually been there? And it becomes this kind of um, this has happened to me a couple times and I become a bit obsessed with this idea of am I recreating an experience I didn't have that was always virtual, that was never physical. And so I think, um, to kind of swing back to the other part of your question, I think that this desire for reality will always kind of pull us in one way, right? It'll, it'll, still, it'll still kind of, we can take joy in the virtual, right? And whatnot. 
But then sometimes elements like that will come up and we're like, oh, actually, I actually want to have be in the physical spot, right? So to kind of give an example, I was re- re- recently in Pingyao and Pingyao is uh, the site of the Pingyao International Film Festival, which Jia Junke also organizes. And it's also a film setting for several of his films. And I was kind of doing the same method as I was in this chapter of interesting, like looking for the, um, the same shots I had seen from the films. And at one point, I kind of lost myself in the search. I became kind of really obsessed with trying to get the, ex- the perfect angle of this one scene from one of his films. And I had to actually stop myself and kind of reflect on it and do this auto ethnography. It's like, what are you doing? Where is this obsession coming from? Because it had stopped being just a, um, I don't know, uh, a research project. It became actually something much more grounded, right? And this is a kind of a, um, like I'm a phenomenologist. So I kind of studied phenomena and I studied people's reactions to phenomena. And I really wanted to stop and kind of think, why are you so all of a sudden, just really desiring to get this shot, you know, be in this right space, right? It's really good to hear that and self-reflection mm. of your own sort of involvement, because I wanted to ask you about that. This, there's a strong ethnographic element to your paper there. And I was wondering if um, that sort of generates any ethical issues or controversies about the way that you um, represent the park and the film. Yeah. I think um, I didn't really see myself as being someone, like I'm not a selfie person. Like I don't take selfies. That's a different type of tourism. Like, oh, look, there's a picture of me in the space, right? Um, it was actually this kind of bizarre, I guess, desire to actually just be the camera, right? And find the angle. Um, I think a lot of my my research is actually autoethnography, right? And so um, this comes part of the film phenomenology, thinking about originally theorizing about why I'm reacting to certain things, right? So I think ethics-wise, it's always an... Um, kind of an examination of my own reaction. I think I'm always really, um, I'm always really apparent. That's what I'm doing, right? Mainly because I think it's important that this is not, you know, data that's getting gotten from other people or other people's reactions, but I always kind of ground it in myself going, this is my reaction to it. And these are the theories I'm using to analyze it. I accept that other people are kind of have different reactions. No one else is going to be like obsessive in certain ways like I am, right? But I think it's not an obsession that I was actually planned. It's something that just kind of popped up. And then when I became cognizant of this obsession, that's when I kind of turned it into a research project, if that makes sense. It does, absolutely. Can you give us some other examples of other kind of research projects and papers that has actually built off that interest and that kind of very personal relationship? Basically, every, mostly everything I've ever done <laughs> is coming from, from this, right? And this is often what I'm telling my students, because my students will come to me and they'll say, oh, I'm really interested in such and such. And I'm always asking questions like, why? You know, tell me more. And sometimes they try to um, try to say, well, this is a research project of interest because of blah, blah, blah. I'm like, let's go back to your initial reaction. What are you feeling? What, you know, what is your response? What is the mood? I go through all these affective states and then I get to, well, you know, what are you thinking? Right. And so I kind of come from this, this moment that strikes you that you don't know you've been stricken. Right. And kind of playing with that. So, um, Yeah, most of my research projects are like that. I initially, I always describe myself as a Chinese film specialist because that's my training, my history, my background, my language, et cetera, et cetera. But I also describe myself as a film phenomenologist. And so I'm interested in how the experience of film makes meaning. And so I've often used the same thing for a variety of different films that are not just Chinese, but in other different contexts. And I specifically focus on how film forms create meaning on me that are different than other forms, right? So for example, I've been writing quite a bit about the effect of the gaze on film. So when um, the gaze, uh, the eyes of the character break the fourth wall and seem to interact with the viewer, right? And so I've done a lot of work on that in different articles and different chapters. My book really examines a lot of different, these different elements as well. And so I think it's just really part of everything I do always kind of swings back to this kind of phenomenology. I think it's because I always, that's how I kind of became interested in the topics. Um, And it's also, I think my training coming from Goldsmiths where things like performativity, affect, those are all kind of part of the environment there. I think if I would have gone to a different university, perhaps I would have been a part of a different environment. Maybe I'd be more interested in the economy or politics or or that type of thing. So I think that kind of has imbued me with a different way as well. 
that's really interesting the way you attribute that to the actual institution that you trained in. I hadn't thought about that as an aspect before, and I think you're there. Yeah. Um, I'm also quite impressed by the way you characterize your research in that way. You're able to pull it all together because I think there's often this idea if you always follow what you're interested in, you actually use lose focus. And so your sort of track record becomes very kind of scattered in that you have all of these these different elements and these different projects. And the question is, how do these relate to one another and how do you package yourself? And you seem to have found a very good way to do that. I hope it works. I know that it's this kind of the instigator. It, it's what does the spark. So, for example, when I think about the research projects I'm most passionate about, they're all examining a reaction I had to something, every single one of them. And it becomes just kind of this, oh, I want to know more about this. I want to read more theory. I want to do X, Y, and Z. You know, it becomes this kind of a motivating factor, right? Sure. And even my other research projects, they always kind of contain like this kind of kernel of like phenomenology or reaction. They have to have like some sort of passion. I agree with that completely. Yeah. yeah. I think it's also just to kind of swing back. I think um, about the institutions we go to, they kind of, we are kind of influenced by our teachers about the environment, right? And if you're trying to understand something or understand the theory, you have to think about the genealogy of the theory. So it's not just someone has just kind of it just magically appeared, right? There is a specific genealogy. They trained under somebody. They were influenced by other people, right? And you can kind of see these kind of different threads. And that's why I always kind of describe it as a genealogy. So if you're kind of struggling with something to kind of go back through the genealogy and kind of see, okay, how can you kind of relate this or how can you understand it better, right? Sure. Yeah. I think in following this interest, it must have been actually quite difficult uh, from your article. You talk about the pans, the long takes or the sort of cinematography there. That sounds quite complex in a sense. So you must have had to put yourself in some difficult situations, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And it was also very naive because I'm not a cinematographer and I don't have the same camera and the same lens that, that, that they utilized. I don't have the various equipment, right? So it became kind of comical at times because I knew this in my head, right? Like it's like, Corey, you're not a cinematographer. You don't have this equipment. You don't have the screening notes, right? You, you don't have any of that stuff. What the hell are you doing? And it became this kind of this obsession of this interest in actually just kind of having this angle and trying to do it as, as much as I, best as I could. And it's kind of to swing back something I haven't really thought about until right now is like your question about temporality of the, the park. The idea of temporality also affected my examination of me being the camera, right? Because these films are from 20 years ago. And the one thing that has changed are the trees. And so there were several times when I'm trying to find these exact shots. I'm like, wait, the tree was a sapling back then. Now it's this proper tree. Now I can't see this. You know, so there was kind of like that kind of thing as well, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. So I, I realize the article or the chapter has come out quite recently, but has there been any reaction to it that, that you're aware of? Has there been conversations started with it? Uh, any criticism potentially? Um, it only came out October 13th, yeah. so it's been a bit more than a month. Um, I think like no, like most academic um, products, especially ones that are kind of in books as opposed to online articles, is that not a lot of people will read them, right? Um, hopefully down the road, somebody might read it and kind of have some questions about it and whatnot. But it's, it's yeah, it doesn't have that kind of scope. I mean, uh, yesterday, I kind of wondered if you'd ask that kind of question. So I just checked and it's only, I think, available at about 77 libraries internationally. And chances are it still hasn't been unpacked and it still hasn't been um, cataloged by the library and it still hasn't been added to the shelves. So, yeah. Sure. Is sure. there an ebook version, though? Uh, the university here has an ebook version. So it is available and yes. our listeners might <laughs> wish to join this conversation yeah, and buy yeah. multiple copies. It's also a bit interesting because um, this performative tur turn in tourism studies, uh, a book, an edited volume that was just exactly about the performative turn in tourism studies was released this summer. So I basically, I, I wish it would have been released before so I could have um, engaged with it a bit more in my chapter because already it had gone to press, right? So obviously there is something that's happening in the in the larger academic, there's another turn, I guess. There's so many turns in academic uh, theories and whatnot, academic movements. So maybe this would be another small turn. What um, would you actually like to achieve from the paper? Um, from the paper, I think I would like to consider 
maybe perhaps developing kind of a methodology for film tourism and the effective elements of film tourism, perhaps a methodology for effective elements of, of place. Um, I think for me, this was a project that was kind of always in the back of my head for a long time. And so now it's kind of come to print. And I think like everything I publish, after it's published, then I kind of realize there's different directions I want to take it. I know that I'm interested in writing a bit more about my um, reaction in Pingyao that I was talking about. And so that was just a, um, in October, right? So right before this came out, I went to Pingyao for the second, third time. And so I think I want to kind of maybe explore this further to see if there's anything else there. You know, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon for me. I'm not too sure if it'll be an interesting phenomenon for other people to read about. So I'm, I'm not delusional when it comes to the stuff I write. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to jump sideways slightly before we wrap anything up. Because I, I did find it fascinating that one of the, the major questions that this approach study kind of raises, uh, when you're looking at a park like this, which is, you know, fakery of a sort, and then you're looking at a film about the phenomenon within this type of fakery, you've got another level. And, and you mentioned things like a uh, documentary-like uh, approach at times. So the documentary has its own issues in terms of what elements are real. So uh, the, the big question this raises, I think, is, is flagged at points, but the notion of reality and then authenticity and how these two conceptions uh, come into play with one another and how we can distinguish them. So I, I'm not sure if you'd like to say anything on that front. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of my research has been kind of thinking about how um, it's difficult to have like a binary between these two, right? Because uh, we find even the, the fake has effects. The fake has real effects, ultimately, right? Um, so, and these effects are sometimes affects, they're sometimes emotions, they're sometimes moods, right? So I think ultimately it's, it's impossible to kind of separate them into two camps, right? I think um, what I find interesting is that when you read the reviews of, say, Treasures from the Wreck of the Unbelievable or the reviews of 24 City, you get these very, very strong reactions and people are like, no, this is fake. This is wrong. Right. And so I think it's not, I, I'm very interested in those reactions because there's this kind of like a moral condemnation of the fake. And so I think that's, that's something to kind of examine further. It's, it's this moral condemnation, right. As opposed to, um, yeah. So I think this is, this is my kind of way of seeing how, um, like to kind of swing back to what I was saying about the film, how there's different registers of meaning that are operating in the film. I think there's different registers of meaning and also perhaps registers of effective states that are operating in these ideas of um, real performative documentary, fake and documentary, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's so many things that are kind of operating on the same level. Yeah. Some, some, I remember reading this about, um, I believe it was in Germany and um, this museum, there was this menhir, right? This big standing stone. And this museum had made a perfect copy of this standing stone and put it in a museum. But because people couldn't touch it or couldn't approach it or couldn't smell it or couldn't, you know, they all assumed it was real, right? And so they all, people, when they were interviewing people reacting with it or seeing it, they all kind of, many of them said they could feel the aura, right? Again, this Benjaminian aura of this real, even though this thing was completely fake, right? And so, of course, this kind of... um brings into notions of relic it brings into notions of um you know we have a very long history in the west and also the east of having relics items that have supposedly come in contact with other items which have supposedly been in contact with religious figures right so there's this kind of thing that we automatically already do when it comes to these items so i think it's it's kind of part of a larger mix of things that are happening sure that, sure yeah. I think that's a good point to kind of end the recording on almost. You, uh, you actually conclude your article by saying, um, by saying how the fake and the park and the, um, the documentary should be uh, inspiring us to examine reality further and how um, we understand it today and how we actually engage with it and ultimately what is real, what is not real. And I think your main point seems to be, does it really matter mm -hmm. if it actually elicits these emotions and these feelings from us? 
Could you finally tell us what can we expect from you in the future? Corey, what are your plans? Will you define reality for us? In the <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what are my plans? My plans, um, basically a lot of my work is uh, reactions or thoughts that I've been kind of, um, I put into a folder and I kind of, when I've had time, I kind of open that folder and I kind of see, oh, what am I kind of doing further? I have been doing more work on kind of more of in the heritage studies side, but also the effective elements of heritage. So I've been working on a project about Canada's Indian residential schools. And so last year when I was on my research leave, I got to visit many of these places. And I also um, visited, uh, I've seen many films about Indian residential schools. And I'm kind of interested in this kind of turn to commemoration that's happening in Canada about how something that was kind of forgotten about or denied is all of a sudden given light and it's become this very massive commemorative movement. So I'm kind of interested in that. And um, I hope to, over the holidays, to explore that a bit further and see if I can get some some thoughts on paper and, and get those circulating. Thank you very much, Corey. We can't wait to see what you come out with next. Thank you very much. With 110 academic staff from 22 countries and regions, the Faculty of Humanities and Social Science is committed to delivering world-class teaching and research with a growing focus on interdisciplinary projects. Our faculty includes the School of Economics, the School of Education and English, the School of International Communications and the School of International Studies, as well as the Language Centre. We are committed to internationally renowned and excellent research in a thriving transdisciplinary environment of outstanding individual and collective research. Our faculty is home to a number of groundbreaking projects, including but not limited to digital heritage, game cultures, the historical and contemporary Silk Roads, health economics, cognitive neuroscience of language, and gender studies. The Faculty of Humanities and Social Science is also proud to host a high percentage of international staff who bring expertise to areas such as history, politics, journalism, media and film studies, education, English, micro and macroeconomics and more as well as a wealth of experience from international universities. We strive to offer an education and student experience reflecting the most up-to-date knowledge and achieve this through the close integration of teaching and research. Our research-led teaching places cutting-edge knowledge at the center of our curriculum, while our academic staff actively engage our students in their ongoing research activities.